I'm just uh, telling you guys about my mulch and my what I do with my roots. So with the mulch layer um, goes on top. It's mulch is um, anything that you can put on top, like even plastic will be good for um, a mulch layer. Um, but for this purpose, it's organic. And this is the plastic mulch. Now there's two types. You've got a clear and a black plastic. And they're really good for heat management and for pest management, both of them. And believe it or not, the clear plastic's better for heat transfer. Um, and they've got biodegradable stuff now, so it's really good for the environment. Finally, <laughs> you can even use the old stuff as a mulch. And there's five types, so nourishes soil, it suppresses weeds, it conserves water, regulates temperature, and prevents erosion. Really, really helpful things. And on the right hand side here, you've got non-mulching. So it maximizes erosion and evaporation losses, wilts crops, and gives you nice weeds. <laughs> Sarcastic. Down the bottom, 10% of rainwater evaporates if you've got mulch above it. But on the right, up to 80% of rainwater evaporates if you've got nothing above it. Yeah, you do the math. Um, this is cool to show on the left here how everything's working. The sun rays get reflected off. So the heat transfer is minimal. So underneath the seeds won't germinate and be fighting and taking nutrients from your roots. And the rain will be not evaporating all the top layers. It'll be perfect. And for my purposes, it's worm castings and that is, they're live worm castings. So it's live worms that are mixed in with this like a wood barky type of material. So when I apply it, I'll apply it and it'll be all wet and there'll be heaps of microbes, there'll be physically things you can see crawling in the little spaces of the wood um, because it's like microarthropods, macroarthropods in there and that's perfect place biochar for it to house all the homes for the bacteria as well. Oops. But yeah, I put that, so I put that stuff on here about that much, about an inch and um, it helps insulate the soil. It maintains like a really good temperature. So on the top left, it tells you the bar graph that in January in the Northern Hemisphere, when it's really cold, it's got a mulch layer, which is the dark green one. So you can see how it keeps it a little bit warmer than if it didn't have a mulch layer on. And on the right hand side in August, when it's the dark green layer, you can see how it's a lot warmer. So there's a big difference. And just reverse that for the Southern Hemisphere, like Australia, mate. And down the bottom, the soil is used as a good temperature buffer and in warmer climates and colder climates because it helps with frost penetration. And this shows the amount of water to soil water that you have, it absorbs more water, heat. So that if you don't have, if it's really dry, heat can transfer quite fast, in other words. That's what that's getting at. This one shows down the bottom that wetter soils warm more slowly than drier soils. So that was just what that last one was talking about. And this shows the depth of temperature with the soil. So at the top, it changes heaps fast. But down the bottom, no, nah, nothing at all. No worries, mate. And um, also, when you're watering it, it reduces compaction. Because you've probably seen all the times, wonder why it's really compacted and it'll just all of a sudden run off down the side. It doesn't if you put a good mulch layer on. It keeps it nice and even. And this shows how compacted soils transfer a lot more heat than on the loose soils on the left-hand side because they're all joined and touching. Um, and it also reduces evaporation. So you have to watch that. So, you know, in winter time when you might sort of want a bit more evaporation, maybe yeah, you might want to put a thick layer. But in summertime, you want to, if you figure you've got to water your pots too quick, just load it up a bit more. Because here shows two ways of water vapor movement in soil. How there's internal within the soil particles and there's externally through soil surface evaporation, which you can reduce through a nice mulch layer. But the problem is also, if you're making mulch, is that it lacks in nematodes and protozera. But you can make your own, you can grow your own protozera by getting some hay or grass clippings or alfalfa, something along those lines, and then you just get it, you put it in a bucket and some water and you brew it up for three to four days. Strain it and then you're done. And here's protozoa, so they're single cell organisms that feed on bacteria and they're really good at decomposition. They're called saprophytes saprophytic in nature. And three up from the bottom, protozera can consume pathogenic organisms including bacteria and fungal disease ones and the favorite food for earthworms and beneficial nematodes and microarthropods, great for the food soil web. 
And here's a recipe that I found that, I don't know, you can do the math and try and scale it back a bit, but at least it's something to work off. Because <laughs> if it's an imbalance, you'll get a nutrient lockout. So there'll be too much fungi and bacteria, not enough nematodes and protozoa to eat them, and it'll be locked out meaning that if something's out of place, everything won't be working symbiotically and harmoniously. There'll be something that'll be looking for and lacking. Yes. So thanks for watching, happy breeding, happy growing to you.